Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Their luck ran out. Take a look. This is the outcome from months of complaints from neighbors and illegal gambling investigation leading to several arrests tonight coming up. Plus, we go back to a former bar that seemed to attract problems for one San Antonio neighborhood. What we found posted on the door of that building, plus new video that residents are sharing with us. But first, we begin with what some are calling a troubling trend that's developed within the Bear County District Attorney's Office. Felony cases, some of them high profile, like the Andre McDonald case, facing issues when it comes to how evidence is handled. Yeah, and that is not the only case in question. The murder of a beloved HEB employee, another instance where issues arose. In this Defender's Report, the night team's Dylan Collier attempts to get to the root of the problem. <laughs> In late October, more than two years after he was charged with his wife's disappearance and death, Andre McDonald sat in a Bear County courtroom in yet another effort to get his bond reduced. Your Honor, uh, first of all, I think Prosecutors in the case acknowledged they had just recently been made aware of an entire share drive of additional evidence handed over by the Bear County Sheriff's Office, described as up to 100,000 items that needed to be reviewed. The visiting judge, Raymond Angelini, did not appear pleased. But you have an obligation under 3914 to turn over everything or you can't be ready. After the state blamed a litany of problems, including COVID within their staff and the lead detective going on leave with a serious medical issue, McDonald's bond was cut down by hundreds of thousands of dollars. He was released from jail on bond a few weeks later. His defense attorney, John Convery, summed up the current status of the case. You heard kind of the finger pointing back and forth between the sheriff and the district attorney's office. It's really a mess. And it's happened elsewhere. Just last month, a mistrial was declared in the capital murder case of R.C. Curtis. Even though Curtis is accused of killing a relative more than six years ago, the prosecution and defense learned of additional DVDs of evidence gathered by police only after the trial was underway. Like McDonald, Curtis was released from custody following a bond reduction. Criminal defense attorney Stephen Gilmore was recently able to get two felony charges against one of his clients dismissed. Neither case on paper looked very good for the defense. And while some would celebrate and move on, Gilmore instead is sounding the alarm, pointing out that both cases had video evidence issues, including an evading arrest allegation with no dashboard camera footage. San Antonio police concede the video wasn't appropriately tagged by officers or downloaded by prosecutors before it was purged. On an evading case where the whole thing is a traffic incident, I need to see what happened. Thank you so much. All right, go. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez, who this month filed for re-election, was not made available for an interview for this story. In a statement, his office told us there is a tremendous and increasing volume of video evidence submitted by law enforcement to our office every year. Occasionally, technology or process issues between law enforcement agencies and our office prevent video evidence from being filed with a case. The DA's office and law enforcement agencies take this seriously and are working together to address the issue. Gonzalez's office, as of late last month, was still reviewing for the second time the 2019 case of an SAPD sergeant who shot and killed a woman while carrying a replica Uzi BB gun after a brief clip of body camera footage surfaced. While the DA claimed publicly that his office wasn't provided a copy of the 18 second clip, SAPD sources say that doesn't tell the whole story and that prosecutors had access to it shortly after the shooting took place. Lapses in communication, Gilmore says, must be fixed. But the idea that we, got, we just got too many cases, you gotta cut us a break, that's, that's nonsense. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The Bear County Sheriff's Office officials did not respond to repeated requests about what happened with the McDonald case evidence. A new state law that went into effect earlier this year could actually help in the long run. Senate Bill 111 requires law enforcement officers to certify in writing that they have handed over all evidence in possession of their agency. 
New tonight, an alleged gambling bust. Several machines pulled out of a San Antonio home. The Bear County Sheriff believes they were used in an illegal gambling operation. This case centers around a home on Tremlett and South Pressa on the city's south side. Investigators also showed us what it looked inside that home. Several gaming machines were lined up against the walls. The sheriff says that drugs were found inside the house and that prostitution may have been taking place there, too. Neighbors complained for months before investigators say they were able to establish a case. Four people arrested in this investigation. There is a number to call if you would like to report a similar situation in your neighborhood. That number is 210-335-GANG. Right now, police left with little to go on in an apparent hit and run. The victim believed to be hit by several cars and or trucks. The body left unrecognizable. A street cleaning crew actually made the discovery on the far east side of town near Foster Road and an access road along I-10. Officers had to shut that section of roadway down about four this morning to try to collect evidence. The Bear County Examiner confirms the victim is a 65 year old man and identity has not yet been released. Police also trying to figure out how a woman's body ended up in a drainage ditch last night. The discovery made on Calabra Road between North General McMullen Drive and Northwest 24th Street. The Bear County Medical Examiner still trying to confirm that woman's identity. Neighbors know it all too well, and so do police. A property on the east side that residents describe as a problem. They say they're scared of getting caught, caught in the crossfire. We've told you about the Twin Sisters Cantina before near Drexel and Hackberry. It's no longer a bar, but more of an after-hours hangout spot. In a five-month span, police were called to this area 73 times. And just this weekend... There was another shooting. The night team's John Paul Barajas reports the city is now doing something about it. We feel trapped in our own homes. I wake up in the morning. I don't turn on any of our lights. I leave the alarm set and I peek through the blinds until I know it's all clear. Prisoners in their own homes. That's how Anna Hardcastle and her neighbors say they feel. This home security video from Friday captures why. You can hear the ringing out of gunshots. You then see a man taking cover behind a fence. The crime happening off of Drexel and Hackberry. SAPD says an argument broke out and ended with one man being shot in both legs. The shooter ran from the scene. He still hasn't been caught. Choosing to hide your identity. Why is that? With the gunshots going off, if they're carrying it to the bars and what's to get, keep them to, from going, come back and retaliate. In November, we aired the concerns of those living here because of a different shooting that also led to one man being shot in the leg, along with two homes and a car getting hit in the crossfire. The city then took action. A notice to revoke the certificate of occupancy was placed on this door by the city on Friday. The notice has since been removed, but it stated that they found evidence that there was gatherings inside because of the amount of open containers and trash, as well as a cash drawer full of money behind the bar. More needs to be done. That whole area needs to be fenced off, confined to, you know, only the actual property owner. We reached out to that property owner in November. We still haven't heard back. As for the building in question, TABC records show they lost their liquor license in February of 2020. There are no telling what's going on. He's just worried about what's going to happen next. According to the notice on the building in question, if gatherings, if gatherings continue, it could be punished with up to fines of up to $2,000. And as in for the latest shooting, police say they will question the man who was shot in hopes of catching the shooter. At Public Safety Headquarters, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. CPS Energy continues to face skepticism as it hopes to increase rates on your gas and power bills. The utility says it's needed to help keep up with growth and pay for fuel costs from February's freeze. But some city council members, like some residents, not exactly on board with the proposal. The defenders uncovered a long list of expenses like steak dinners and limo rides that you paid for. CPS Energy now has a new CEO who's trying to get the utilities point across about the proposal during several town halls that are to be held. They want city council to approve a rate hike that would bump up the average bill by $5.10 per month. City council will take up a vote on January 13th. Now, this wouldn't be the only increase likely. The utility also plans to discuss another increase in the next few years. Now to the recovery efforts in the Midwest. President Joe Biden pledging to do whatever it takes as long as it takes, he said, following that outbreak of tornadoes there. Today, he saw the damage firsthand. 
of the scope and scale of this destruction is almost beyond belief. The president announcing the federal government will cover 100 percent of the cost of all emergency work for the next 30 days. The cleanup far from over and many people still missing in Kentucky. The governor there says that he expects the death toll will continue to rise. And our own neighbors right here helping in that recovery effort in the Midwest. A phone bank held at the KSAT studios today taking donations for the Red Cross. And we currently have $7,185 raised with more donations still being counted tonight. All of that money goes directly to the tornado relief efforts. You still have a chance to pitch in. There are two ways to donate. You can visit redcross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Still ahead on the night beat, the city is transforming the traditional game of Lotaria into a scavenger hunt throughout downtown. The prize packs that are up for grabs and how you can play coming up. And you've heard the phrase snakes on a plane. I think it was a movie. But what about snakes in a Christmas tree? That story coming up. And another shakeup at a local school district, South San ISD. No stranger to controversy. It is now looking towards what could be the eighth superintendent there in 10 years. That story next on the Night Beat. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by the Joe A. Gomez Law Firm. Hi, I'm Matt Powell from the Gomez Law Firm, wishing all of our service members and their families a safe and happy holiday season. In tonight's South San ISD, welcoming a new interim superintendent to the district. Henry Izaguete is set to lead that district while the district launches an inquiry into current superintendent Mark Puig. That inquiry launched after a private conversation on a hot mic surrounding decisions on hiring. Izaguete is a district graduate, was working for Southside ISD. He says his focus is on raising the academic performance of students the district already has a high failure rate. Details on how much Izaguirre's contract with the district will cost taxpayers has not been released yet. It's not clear how long the inquiry involving Puig will take. The district has a history of controversy. Puig is the seventh superintendent for South San in 10 years. And now to the fight against COVID-19. Boosters are believed to restore peak protection when it comes to the Omicron variant. That is the word from Dr. Anthony Fauci. Omicron cases in the U.S. have been doubling every two days, with cases up sevenfold within the past week now. To get ahead of a potential spread, the National Guard in Boston unloading cases of rapid COVID tests, 31,000 kits going to people there. Health experts continue to encourage people to get vaccinated before getting together over the holidays. The pandemic, of course, pushed a lot of people out of their jobs. So those looking for employment right now should be aware that scammers are looking to take advantage. One woman in San Antonio shared her story after she was cheated out of thousands. We have the red flags to watch out for when on the job hunt. You can find all that online at ksat.com. San Antonio bringing back a holiday scavenger hunt that still allows people to stay six feet apart. It combines the game of Lotaria with Christmas decor and prizes. This year, the cards will have a SeaWorld theme. The goal is to find the cards hidden in the Christmas trees all around downtown. The scavenger hunt is free and runs through the end of the month. Those with the highest scores will win a prize pack that includes tickets to SeaWorld. You can get a clue on where to begin your search by visiting TravisParkSA.com. Speaking of Christmas trees, most people look forward to a surprise under their tree. Well, look at what was hiding in these branches. No, nope. Rob and Marcella found a boom slang snake in their Christmas tree. The couple lives in South Africa, where the snake is listed as one of the most venomous in Africa. Ooh. A snake expert believes the animal was looking for food, water and shelter. That expert captured the animal safely and released it back into the wild. The snake is between four and five feet long. Oh, no, mm -mm, no, thank you. Yeah, that's on the naughty list. <laughs> you could tell that guy was the expert because he was so calm right. with that. Just no venomous facial snake. expression. Yeah. Oof. yeah. Let's look at this snake for you. <laughs> How about that? No, yeah. <laughs> oh, y'all are rushing your Christmas trees right now. Okay, hold on. Just got to check one more time before bed. <laughs> that was in South Africa, not South Texas. So I think we're good.
far, far yes. away from here. Okay, we actually have some promising rain chances to talk about. A lot to go over and a lot to talk about. First of all, record challenging warmth the next couple of afternoons, so through Friday. Then a strong cold front hits Saturday morning. That's our transition day. Things are going to change a lot from the morning on into the afternoon on Saturday with some promising rain chances actually looking pretty good for Saturday morning through maybe the early afternoon. We've got a 60% chance right now and there could be some pockets of say half an inch to an inch of quick heavy rainfall, a few rumbles of thunder, but then another round of some widely scattered rain late Sunday on into Monday. We've got a 40% chance for that uh, activity. Again, that would be late Sunday, Sunday night on into early Monday. So let's talk about the big picture. Quiet across the Lone Star State. Yeah, we had a few sprinkles, a little few drops here and there today. Not a big deal. The activity though in the severe weather farther north up the plains quickly that Squall line quickly moving eastward with the severe thunderstorms now moving into parts of Wisconsin and Illinois. I mean, there were some storm motions where the storms were actually moving at between 70 and 90 miles per hour. Just crazy in a, in a measured wind gust of 96 miles per hour at the airport in Lincoln, Nebraska. I mean, these meant business today and they still do as they move off to the east and on the back side of it, some cooler air Now all that moisture and that activity staying out of our area on the back side of that system. Non thunderstorm winds right now gusting to 60 miles per hour south in South Dakota and parts of Nebraska. So that's a wound up system on its heels. Another disturbance now coming into the Pacific Northwest, bringing more moisture to the western states. Yes, some flooding with it, but too much of a good thing in spots, but they need the moisture. They need to fill their reservoirs. Deep drought there, so it's good to see some moisture. This is what we're going to tap into some of the Pacific moisture and some of the energy from that next system. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow, more of the same future cast indicates too, just clouds for the morning, a little bit of sunshine into the afternoon. Friday repeat performance Saturday. Best chance of rain roughly between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. And temperatures will be going from about 70 degrees at 8 a.m. down to 50 degrees at the noon hour with the wind howling. So we talked about those rain chances up to 60% on Saturday and then 40% late Sunday. 81 was our high today, four degrees shy of the record. Right now, dew point is 68, so muggy, 72 degrees. For the most part, lower 70s, and we're not going to see a big temperature drop for the rest of the night. Canyon Lake now 71 along with Rio Medina and 73 in Pleasanton along with Carrizo Springs. Well, trim off a few more degrees before sunrise tomorrow. About 68 in the morning, some patchy fog, otherwise just low clouds lingering until the early afternoon, making it to about 80 in San Antonio. If we hit 81, that would tie the record for the day. But we're thinking about 77 Timberwood Park, Von Army 81 in Elmendorf at 80. Friday, very similar, very close to the record. Record is 82, we'll be near it. And then Saturday, temperatures plummet to near 50 by the noon hour. Sunday, cool, near 50, cloudy, with some scattered rain late in the day. By the way, Saturday wind gusts, probably around 45 miles per hour. Wow. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. I watched part of tonight's Spurs game and they get close, then they get far away, close, far away. They could just could never get over that hump. Yeah, and it started in the first quarter yeah. when the Hornets made 10 three pointers to, I believe, just two for the Spurs. The Hornets are deadly from three point range and it showed tonight. Yes, the Hornets sting the Spurs and in big game coverage, the Shiner Comanches played for back to back state championships. And of course, the Brooks brothers were heavily involved coming up. First, to my knowledge, is the first uh, signee of a Power Five scholarship in football in the history of the school. That's Southside football head coach Ricky Locke introducing Power Five quarterback Richard Torres on National Signing Day in Big Board Sports. The Spurs were home tonight to face the Charlotte Hornets. Lonnie Walker IV was out, though, with the stomach flu. First quarter, Miles Bridges sinks a three-pointer, and the Hornets lead 44-23. Charlotte made 10 of 15 threes and led 46-31 after one. They entered shooting 38.3% from threes this season, tied for best in the league. Second quarter, Spurs trying to fight back. Kelvin Johnson makes a seven-foot floater, and San Antonio's down eight, but the Hornets led 73-57 at halftime. Third quarter now, Spurs still fighting. Derek White goes slam dunk 
Duncan, they're down 10, 75, 65, but San Antonio just couldn't get it going. Kelly Oubre Jr. steals the ball and feeds Gordon Hayward for the layup, and it's 93-72 Hornets. Timeout Spurs. Late in the quarter, Hayward scored eight straight in the third, and Charlotte led 110 82 after three. He had 41 points after three, and he was done for the night. And the Hornets beat the Spurs 131 to 115. There's no excuse, to be honest with you. That's, it should never be the case. No matter how hot they were, whatever you want to say, there's no excuse. Like, should have been more physical, had more effort, been more focused. It just wasn't a good night defensively for us at all. Yeah best offense in the league if you look at the numbers so um just didn't come out ready to go and it made us play do you notice pop got a haircut the spurs will hit the road and play at the utah jazz friday night at eight the UIL State Football Championships are underway. The 15-0 Shiner Comanches face the 15-0 Holly Bearcats with a Class 2A Division I title at AT&T Stadium tonight. Late second quarter, handoff goes to Doug Brooks. He runs left, slips a tackle, and breaks off a 28-yard touchdown run to make a 21-12 Shiner your halftime score. He's listed at 6 foot, 265 pounds, and he certainly lied on his feet. Third quarter, Shiner QB Drew Winsky tosses it back to Doug Brooks. He hits the hole for a 10-yard touchdown run, his third of the game, and Shiner is rolling 28 to 12. That score was a result of a Bearcats turnover and the Shiner Comanches do it. They defend their state title 47 to 12. They are back to back state champions. Today kicked off the early signing period, allowing high school student athletes to sign a national letter of intent. We stopped by Floresville, Southside, Judson and Central Catholic. So let's start with the buttons where two friends since middle school are heading to UTSA. It's a dream come true, you can say, really, that not only do I get to continue playing on at a D1 level, but I get to do that with somebody who I've been dreaming of doing it with since, you know, I was 13 years old. So it's a blessing. To say that I'm going to be with him in the next level, you know, it's, it's surreal. So I, I always know I have someone, you know, there with me on the first day and, you know, for the next four or five years. And, uh, you know, we're at brothers. We're brothers at this point. So... You know, I'm extremely comfortable and you know, I'm just excited. It's a blessing, but you know, they're, they're all excited. I mean, it's a little way bit from home, but you know, they just want the best for me. And then I'm just thinking about more than just football because football will never get you like, like as far as pr Princeton degree will. Just how it felt like family. It felt like home. When I took my visit back in June, uh, me and my family were just instantly gravitated towards the place and it just felt like home to me and everybody was nice and welcoming. It just felt like the right place. Coach McDaniels, Coach Hogerson, everybody it just felt like a family atmosphere. So I just went with it and they're loving me, I'm loving them. So that's really all it is. The Valero Alamo Bowl awarded more than one million in scholarships today after the break. The Valero Alamo Bowl awarded more than one million in scholarships today to a record 160 San Antonio high school and college students via two programs. The first 660,000 will be split between a record 88 winners of Valero Alamo Bowl student athlete scholarship winners. The students included at least one winner from every San Antonio area public school and well-established private schools. I was really excited because I usually tend to worry about money going to college and knowing that I have this money now, it really helps me out. I was nervous. I didn't really think about it that much. I, when I got it at the mail, was really surprised. But I'm just super grateful for Valero Bowl for giving me this scholarship. And how about this? Spurs head coach Greg Popovich was named USA Basketball National Co-Coach of the Year, along with South Carolina women's head coach Don Staley, in recognition of their leadership of gold medal winning USA basketball teams in 2021. And if you remember back, that was not a piece of cake for Team it USA. I mean, Pop not. certainly did a job with that. Well deserved. Yeah, and like you said, got a haircut. Too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. Next couple of days, more of the same. Near 80 degrees, humid, morning clouds, a little bit of afternoon sun. Changes come on Saturday in the morning up until about 10 a.m., 11 a.m. or so, we'll be near 70 degrees. Then by the noon hour and thereafter, we'll be near 50. Big temperature drop becoming gusty as well, and some scattered showers, few thunderstorms likely. Some locations could see a quick inch of rain. Sunday, scattered rain likely late on into Monday morning. All right, thanks, Adam. That's it for the night beat, GMSA at 4.30. Have a good night.